Okay, so we left off yesterday talking about non-electrolytes or covalent. Uh, I'm sorry, non-electrolytes would be those things that are covalent, okay? Um, like glucose uh, is a covalent molecule. It's a, it's a crystal, but it doesn't form ions in solution. It doesn't form ions, it just stays as one piece, okay? So the I factor or the von Hoff factor for that is just one, okay? So when we're considering these collegiative properties for covalent things, then we can simply use the equation as it is. We don't have to manipulate it all uh, to consider uh, something else, okay? However, when it's an electrolyte solution, meaning there are more than just one particle, type of particle in the solution, we have to consider all those particles because collegiative properties are dependent on the number of particles, okay, rather than just a, um, uh, what it is. So here, if it's 0.1 molar sodium chloride, that means I have 0.1 molar sodium and 0.1 molar chlorine in solution. So the actual number of particles went from one to two. So I have two particles instead of just one. And so the molarity, the total molarity of the particles in the solution uh, has to be multiplied by two. So if this is 0.1, I have to multiply it by two. So the actual molarity of this or molality, because we'd be working in molality, the actual molality of this solution would be 0.2 rather than 0.1. So that would double the effect that it would have on the boiling point or the freezing point change, okay? <coughs> yes, yes, yes. So we call this the von Hoff factor. Um, so the actual number of particles divided by the number of formula units. You don't have to actually do this, okay? But um, that's, that's the idea we call it I, okay? So for non-electrolytes, it's one. For sodium chloride, it would be approximately two, okay? Uh, for calcium chloride, so you can't really see it down there very well. Um, I can hide my toolbar. Okay, I'll work on that. Okay, there. That's better. Okay, so calcium chloride, you have one calcium and you have two chlorines. So that would give us three particles, okay? So um, depending on how many things you have will de determine your von Hoff factor. Now, it actually being three isn't completely true, but it's a, it's a close uh, approximation. So these would be our new uh, equations for boiling point elevation, freezing point depression, and osmotic pressure we have to include I into these, okay? We have to include I, which is the von Hoff factor, okay? So these are your, your predicted von Hoff factors based on the number of particles that these would become in solution. So for example, sodium chloride would be predicted to be two particles. Well, the von Hoff factor is actually measured to be 1.9, okay? Um, iron, Iron 3 chloride 
that would be predicted to be four particles, three chlorines, one iron, and you would measure it I as 3.4. Okay, so obviously you're not going to know this unless they tell you. So if they tell you the actual von Hoff factor, you would use that. Otherwise, you would predict the number of particles and use that. Okay, for an approximation of of what it would be. <coughs> Okay, so colloidals are uh, just essentially a solution that has larger particles, and you can see them because they're so large. Well, you can't actually see them unless you shine a light on them, but once you shine a light on them, uh, it will illuminate the particles, and you, they will become visible in the solution. They're still suspended in the solution. Okay, we call it a colloidal suspension. Um, but yeah, the light, this is called the Tyndale effect, when you can see those particles. Here, back in the tree brush, right, all the dust particles and everything in the air, the light shines through and they illuminate. You couldn't see them before, but they're there. So that they're colloidal uh, particles, they're larger particles, and so therefore they are, um, uh, they're able, you're able to see them. Because a, a regular solution, if you shine a light through it, you can't, the particles won't illuminate, okay? They're, in, they're invisible, essentially. So here's some examples of colloidal um, fog, smoke, um, milk of magnesia. Milk of magnesia essentially has these uh, solid particles. Milk of magnesia is always a fun thing to drink. If you've ever had that, it's a laxative. Um, okay, so those those would be kind of the ideas of uh, colloidal sus uh, suspensions. Okay, a little different than just a regular solution. Okay, <clears throat> so if you have something um, that is hydrophilic. That means that it loves water. So basically, it's also polar. Polar things interact with polar things. If you have something that's hydrophobic, it fears water. It gets away from it. It runs away. Okay. So here they, they're showing an example of a protein molecule. Okay. And proteins, when they're first made, they're made as long chains of amino acids, okay? It's just this big, long chain of hundreds, maybe thousands of amino acids just put together, we call it a polypeptide. So it's this big, elongated thing, and it has to go from here to here, a globular protein. How does it do that? It folds on itself. How does it fold? Well, it's surrounded by water. And all the stuff that hates the water <coughs> turns to the inside, and all the stuff that loves the water turns to the outside. And this thing starts to fold in on itself, just spontaneously, all by itself. It knows how to fold. You don't have to do anything. And then you get a protein with a very specific shape to it uh, that will do a job. That's what proteins do. They do jobs in the cell. They go about and do all the jobs. So um, you go from a polypeptide to something like that because of these hydrophobic, hydrophilic interactions of the, of the amino acids. Some of them love water. Some of them hate water. And depending on the position that you put a water-loving and a water-hating uh, amino acid will determine how it folds, okay? So this sequence of amino acids is very important to the structure of, um, of it, okay? <clears throat> so, um, things like soap, so if you've ever considered, if I want to wash my dish, it's all greasy, right? 
and I want to clean it, I can't just run it under the water. That's not going to do anything. It's just going to, all the water is just going to run off of that slippery, greasy um, stuff, and it's not going to wash. So how do I wash it? I use a soap. Well, why is it that a soap can wash the greasy thing, whereas the water can't? What's that? No? No ideas? Okay. Soap is oil. What's that? Soap is oil. Like soap has a, a hydro, okay? So soap has a hydrophilic and a hydrophobic part to it. It has both, okay? It has both a water loving and a water hating. And the water hating part loves other water hating molecules. And so you'll get things like these soap, these uh, greasy particles, and the, uh, the greasy part will get surrounded by the nonpolar section of the soap. And um, then you'll have all the polar parts of the soap hanging on the outside. And then what, what do they interact with? They interact with the water. And now it can, you can wash it down the sink because you've surrounded all those grease particles with uh, nonpolar parts that can then uh, be washed by the polar parts with water, okay? And so that's kind of how um, uh, soap would work and, uh, and create these, uh, the, uh, wash away those colloidal greasy particles uh, in your solution, okay? Oh, here we go. So this is gonna go through that, I guess. Okay, so here's your hydrophobic tail, your hydrophilic head. You can see that the tails interact with all the greasy stuff. And then you'll have the polar ends out here, and now I can wash it away. Okay, and so that's kind of what uh, a soap would, would be composed of. Okay, so. Um, If you're ever stranded at sea, <laughs> um, and you know you don't you don't want to drink the sea water because that's just going to dehydrate you. Okay, then something you could do you could use a piece of glass to uh, um, allow the evaporation of the sea water. The water vapor comes off and it collects here, and then you could collect it, uh, purify because it you know the ions will stay down there in solution, okay? Um, so you can see there's a lot of ions in the seawater. Not a, not a good thing to drink, okay? Or you could uh, better <laughs> use one of these, reverse osmosis, okay? Uh, if you're stranded at sea, <laughs> to drink the water, that would be much better. Because it, what it's doing is it's, it's creating a, a pressure <coughs> um, that isn't natural, it's, a, it's an unnatural pressure. The natural pressure would cause um, uh, the fresh water to dilute the, the seawater. But if you pump a pressure here, then it's gonna push it the other way, okay? So, and then now you're purifying out uh, the fresh water from the, the seawater, okay? And you can drink it then. Okay, that's it for that chapter. Okay. Oh, and I did post these onto Canvas, these uh, PowerPoints for you to, to look at if you want. Yes? How do you decipher just by looking at it if it's a non-electrolyte or electrolyte? Okay. So the way that you know if it's an electrolyte or a non-electrolyte um, is if does it doesn't have a metal in it. That's your first clue. So covalent ionic. If it's, yeah, covalent ionic. Okay. Okay. Ionic would be electrolyte. Okay. Covalent would not. Okay. So if it has a metal, that's a, a giveaway that this is an ionic solution. Okay. If it just has non-metals, then it's <coughs> covalent. Okay, so um, I've set your homework for chapters uh, 10 and 11. 10 is due on Friday, in the day Friday, 
and chapter 11 is due on Monday. So make sure you guys are working on those, okay? All right, now we're going to talk about kinetics. And um, kinetics is basically talking about how fast a reaction is occurring. How fast does it go? Just like the rate uh, of how fast you drive in your car, right? Miles per hour. Well, in chemistry, we talk about rate um, by how fast is the disappearance of a product over sec per second, okay? So that's, that's what we're looking at. The concentration, the molarity of it, how fast does it decrease per second? And that will tell us the speed of the reaction. <clears throat> um, okay, so thermodynamics is going to tell us, is there enough energy for this reaction to actually occur? Do I have enough energy? If I don't, then it's not going to. The molecules are going to collide. There's not enough energy in that collision, so they just bounce off of each other. No reaction takes place. Okay. However, the kinetics tells us um, once that reaction, if that reaction is going, how fast does the reaction proceed? How fast is it proceeding? And there's a lot of different factors that will determine the speed of the reaction. Okay. Some reactions are very fast, some are very slow. Rust. Rust doesn't happen like that, right? It a, takes a long time to oxidize that iron. Um, so some reactions are much faster than others. And so, uh, but that's what we're looking at. And it's a, the reaction rate is change in the concentration of a reactant um, per second. Okay, and that's how we're going to measure it. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so here, when we say change in brackets, do you guys know that these brackets mean concentration? Is that familiar to you? Okay, so if you ever see something written in the brackets, that means the concentration of. So the change in the concentration of A over the change in time will tell us the rate, the rate of um, the disappearance of A, okay? Now B is a product, so we wouldn't describe uh, the rate of B as the disappearance of B, but the appearance of B. So the change in the concentration of B over time is the, how fast is B appearing, okay? And if I know this, then I can know this. I just have to measure one of them. That's the nice thing about a chemical reaction and rate. Um, I don't have to measure every single component of the reaction. I just need to be able to measure one of them. So a lot of times, um, you're gonna choose the one that is colorful, that you can see occurring and that's the component that you're going to measure. And then you're, you'll be able to use that to determine the rates of everything else, stoichiometrically, OK? <clears throat> because th the coefficients will uh, help us determine those, OK? So A is negative because it is the disappearance, OK? The disappearance of A. So that's why it's a negative term there. It is disappearing, whereas B is appearing. Okay, so we can kind of see that taking place here. At first, it's all black, right? And if we're measuring the disappearance of B, you can see B is disappearing over time. So we could measure that, or we could measure the appearance of A, uh, of B over time, sorry, did I say A? A is black, so it's disappearing. B is red, so it's appearing. We can measure either one over time. But because it's a one-to-one -one ratio, one A for every one B, the disappearance of A and the appearance of B have the exact same rates, okay? 
They, they mimic each other. <clears throat> So this is a good example of how you could measure um, the rate of something. So here we have bromine, and it's brown, it's red. Okay? But as this reaction takes place, it turns into Br minus, and it becomes colorless. So at first it has a red-brown color, but over time it will become colorless. So we can measure the disappearance of bromine over time by measuring how deep the color is. And we would do that by using a spectrophotometer. Okay? A spectrophotometer measures wavelengths of light that pass through a solution, and uh, they would be able to detect how concentrated the Br2 is because of how deep the color is. Okay? Because you can relate those two things, uh, the absorption to the wavelength. So using Beer's Law, which you guys are going to use in the, the lab, okay, uh, you would be able to measure the concentration of something uh, um, because of its color. Okay. And that's exactly what you're going to do. You're gonna, we're going to take something that's very colorful. Um, we're going to first establish um, how concentrated it is at certain wavelengths and get a standard and then we're going to do our experiments and you'll be able to relate those to that, that standard and determine the concentrations over time and the rates, the rates of that, that that reaction is taking place at. Okay? And I can, I can relate all of these terms to each other. So Br2, um, I can relate to the, um, if I know the disappearance of Br2, which is um, uh, negative concentration of Br2 over the change in time. This would be change, okay? That is equal to, that is equal to one half the change in the concentration of H plus over the change in time. Stoichiometrically, okay? It equals the disappearance of this equals one half of the appearance of that. Okay? Stoichiometrically, that's how we would relate them. <clears throat> okay, so the, this is just going through uh, rates and instantaneous rates that you could obtain uh, through these, uh, these instantaneous uh, curves. But here, we would plot the data. And this, this isn't really a super useful curve to us. There's some useful information, but what we like to do is we like to manipulate those um, curves uh, so that we can find actual slopes, and that, that will tell us rate constants. And we'll see how to do that. Um, but here, at least you could find an average rate. And that average rate um, would help you uh, determine a year overall rate. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay, so this is more useful to us. Okay, we get a, we get a straight line curve uh, and it will allow us to determine a rate constant. So I can determine if I know the slope of this line I can use that as a constant to determine the rate at any concentration. Okay? That even is something that doesn't fall on this line, because I would assume it would extend. Okay? So um, the rate uh, is equivalent to the concentration of Br2 by the rate constant that I could obtain. So if this is my rate data and I plotted it, I could find the slope of that line. Uh, and I would be able to find K. So for Br2, Br2, this reaction would have a rate constant. And I could use that rate constant to determine the concentration of Br2 over time. Okay. 
uh, or what the rate is at any concentration of Br2. So that's where these slopes become very useful to us. Okay. <coughs> That's the slope. Rise over run, rate over concentration of Br2 equals the rate constant. So the rate constant for this is 3.5 times 10 to the negative 3 seconds to the negative 1. Okay. And this, um, uh, well, and this would be a first order reaction, and we'll talk about those. Um, but for an, another type of reaction, a second order, to get the straight line, we'd have to m manipulate the data a little differently. Okay. Okay. So pressure uh, is also a way that you can, uh, instead of concentration, we could just measure the pressure and consider that to be kind of the concentration. Pressure and concentration um, are, are are kind of equivalent in that way um, because of uh, gas, the ideal gas law. Okay, so the concentration of, of oxygen here, 1 over RT, P, uh, <coughs> and your rate is still the change in the concentration of O2 over time, change in time. Okay. All right. All right, so this is how we relate them stoichiometrically, like we were talking about earlier. Okay. If you have um, 2A to 1B, then two moles of A disappear for each mole of B that is formed. So if I'm going to relate that stoichiometrically, I would say that 1 half the, of the disappearance of A is equal to um, the appearance of B, okay? And that would allow me to, to, if I find B, then I can find A because I know how they relate to one another. Or if I find A, I could find B because I know how they relate to one another, okay? So here is the generalized form of that. These are all their coefficients. So, and uh, for, for pro, uh, reactants, it needs to be negative because they're disappearing. For products, it needs to be positive. Negative 1 over A, negative 1 over B uh, equals 1 over C, 1 over D, okay, for the rate. And you can kind of simplify this because a lot of times you're not given the change of A over T. You're given the rate. So it becomes that um, negative 1 over A times the rate is equal to negative 1 over B uh, times the rate. Okay, So you can kind of simplify it in that way. Right? And that makes it a little easier to work with, to, to, to use. OK, what is the rate expression for the following reaction? So rate expressions are written uh, using reactants only. So this is going to be confusing. And the reason why is because in the next chapters that we get to, we're going to talk about equilibrium. And equilibrium expressions are written using both products and reactants. And equilibrium expressions are easier to write. And so you guys get confused later on because you want to write everything like an equilibrium reaction. Uh, because rate isn't as intuitive, um, but you have to write them differently. With rate, we only look at the reactants. We don't look at the products for the rate expression, only the reactants. So if I was going to write the, um, the rate expression for this, I would say the rate is equal to the concentration of CH4 times the concentration of O2 and we would raise it to its order, n and m. Okay, And this is a point of confusion right here. Because in equilibrium, the orders, what you raise it to, are simply the coefficients. So in this case, if I was doing equilibrium, I would say methane is uh, order of 1, 
oxygen has an order of two. But with rate, that's not the case. We don't use the coefficients, and I want you to understand that because you're going to get confused when we get into equilibrium, when we start using the, uh, the exponents as our coefficients, okay? But we don't in rate. You have to be told what the order is, or you have to determine it exper from experimental data, which you will do. We'll do some examples where you will determine these from experimental data, okay? But that's how you would uh, write these. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Forgot the rate constant. You have to have a rate constant. Equals rate equals the rate constant times the concentration of methane times the concentration of oxygen raised to the order N and M, whatever those would are. Okay? You have to determine it from experimental data or you have to be told what they are. You can't just uh, look at the coefficients. Okay. Whoa. Okay. Um, so there we go. All right. So. Here is a general equation, all right? If I was going to write the rate expression for this, I would say rate equals K, the rate constant, times the concentration of A raised to its order times the concentration of B raised to its order. We don't use C and D. They're not included. We don't include those. We just include the... Um, Reactants, no products. We don't use products. If I was going to determine the overall order of this reaction, the overall order of the reaction would be the orders of the individual uh, reactants added together. So if this is first order and this is second order, the overall reaction order would be three. Okay? So that's how I determine the, the overall reaction order. Okay. So here's some uh, data. And if I'm going to determine the order of a reactant, then I would do it by looking at the concentration I started it with of each thing and what rate I got at those concentrations. Okay, so I have three experiments here. One, two, and three. Look at experiment one and two. In experiment one and two, I held the F2 constant, right? 0.1 and 0.1 molar. I didn't change those. I left them the same. But in experiment two, I changed the amount of um, uh, chloride from uh, 0.1 to 0 0.0, I'm sorry, 0 0.01 to 0 0.04, okay? And that changed my rate. You see how it went from 1.2 to 4.8? That changed my rate. OK. Now looking at experiment one and experiment three, the F2 is changed from 0.1 to 0.2, so I doubled it. And in exper uh, for the chloride ion, it went from uh, 0.01 to point, uh, it stayed the same. 0.01 to 0.01. So that's what you need. You need to, to keep something the same, and you need to change the other thing. That's how I can individually determine what the change is, how F2 is affecting the rate, or how ClO2 is affecting the rate. I have to hold something constant and change the other thing. Okay. So in the first experiment, <coughs> um, I doubled the F2 from point one to point uh, from experiment one to experiment three. Okay, what did that do to the rate? The rate also doubled. Okay, the rate also doubled. So two to the n equals two. 
What is n? 1. So it's first order. This is a first order reactant. So F2 is first order. Okay? What is uh, ClO2? It's first order. You quadrupled it. What happened to the rate? Quadrupled. 4 to the n equals 4. It quadrupled as well. Okay? This is how we determine the order of a reactant by looking at the effect. Okay? What if I had gone from, what if you had doubled the reactant and the rate had quadrupled? It would be second order, right? What would the rate have to, what would be the effect on the rate if it was third order? That's right. And then it would be third order. You look a little confused. Are you okay? Yeah. Okay. So basically what, I, what we're doing is, okay, I doubled this. What and how did it affect the rate? If it doubles the rate, it must be first order. If the, if the effect is the same, then it's first order. Okay? So if I quadruple something and it quadruples, it's first order. If I double something and it quadruples, that's second order. You're mostly going to be working with first and second orders. Yes? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So um, if I take, if I take, Experiment one and experiment three. Okay, look at the concentrations of F2. What happened to them? They doubled, right? Okay, so the concentration doubled. Okay, now if I double that concentration, I raise it to what order to cause the effect of the rate? Now look at the rate. What happened to the rate? It also doubled. Okay, so it must be first order because it had the same effect. Okay, yes, ma'am. It just means uh, how how does that reactant affect the rate? So if I double that reactant, how is it going to affect the rate? If I if I uh, um, if I cut it in half, how is it going to affect the rate? Okay, so that that's all we want to know by the order. The order is going to tell us: does it, if if I double it, does it quadruple the rate? Okay, does it go up by a factor of eight? What does it do? And it's, that's where we're getting these orders from. So to write our rate expression, we need to know what those are. So here, this is my rate expression. Okay, both x and y are what? What are x and y in this reaction? They're both one. They're both first order. So the real rate expression here would be rate equals my rate constant times F2 times ClO2. Okay? And now I, once I know my rate constant, I can determine what the rate is at any concentrations of these two things. I could plug in any numbers here. And because I know the orders, I could calculate this at any concentration once I know the rate constant. I don't know it. I don't know what the rate constant is. So what do I do? I solve for it. Do I have any do I have the information to solve for this? I do. I could choose any one of those three experiments. And I could pl plug that information in right here to find K. OK, let's just do experiment 1. The rate of experiment 1, 1 1.2 times 10 to the negative 3, divided by uh, the concentration of F2, which is 0 0.1. And I don't have to raise it to anything because it's first order. If it wasn't first order, then I would square it or uh, uh, um, uh, cube it. Gosh. CLO2, 0.01, whoops, yeah, 
0 0.01. Okay? And now I can find my rate constant. 1.2 times 10 negative 3 divided by 0.1 divided by 0 0.01. That will be my rate constant. So what's the rate constant? Say it louder, I'm sorry. 1.2 times 10 to the negative 1. Okay. Um. Where's that coming from? Where's that 1.2 times 10 negative 4 coming from? If I take 1.2 times 10 negative 3 oh, divided by oh. this, that's the answer. Okay. <coughs> Okay, um, so if I look at my units here for this rate constant, okay, the rate is in molarity per seconds, and each of these are in concentrations of molarity and molarity. Okay, so um, here the, the molarity units cancel, and I'm left with um, molarity to the negative one and seconds to the negative one, both on the bottom. Okay. And that's how I'm going to determine my rate um, constant, the constant that I would use in this experiment. Did you get it? Sorry? It's like, it's just 1.2, not 10 to the negative. Oh, it's just 1.2? Okay. 1.2. Thank you. Oh, I have an eraser on this one. Okay. Okay, so we're, we want to reiterate that. Rate laws, these, the order of the reactants are always determined experimentally. Okay, we can't determine it from the um, coefficients of the balanced chemical equation, which you will do for equilibrium. That's why it gets confusing. Equilibrium is easy because I can just use the coefficients. So for equilibrium, this would be second order, this would be second order, this would be first order. But that's not the case with rate. Okay? So make sure that you're not getting those confused. And I want to just help you try to understand that early on right now. Um, these are determined experimentally. Okay? <laughs> okay, determine the rate law and calculate the rate constant for the following reaction from the following data. Okay, so that's what I want you guys to do. I want you to, to figure out the orders of the reactants. And then what is K? So that means you're going to have to write a rate expression correctly.
just give you a clue about uh, this one. Does the rate change? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. No. So what's the order? Zero. Zero. Zero order. Basically, it's saying this has no effect at all. You can change the concentration of that. It's not going to change anything. So it's zero order. Okay. Which means you leave it out. You don't even include it. But that's a good thing to remember if, if it does do that. Because sometimes it does. You'll, it'll be zero order. But you, you, you're right. It's not, that's not the case here. I was misinterpreting.
guys find for K? Point zero eight. Are we getting something like that? Mm -hmm. That's what you got. Okay. Um, so they're both first order. This is your rate expression. So you, if you did experiment one, you would set it up to find k in this fashion. 2.2 times n negative 4 divided by 0 0.08 divided by 0 0.034, okay? And that'll find your k. Now you could have used experiments um, two or three to do that. Wouldn't matter which one, okay? You should get the same answer. Now it might, you know, not be exactly the same, but the best way to do it would be to take all three, find the k for all three. This is what you'll do in the lab. You'll take the k for all of your experiments, and you'll find the average of that, and that'll be your most accurate k. Okay. 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 So if we have a first order reaction, um, a to products, rate equals the disappearance of the change of concentration of a over time. And your rate expression would be rate equals K times the ch uh, concentration of A raised to 1 because it's first order. <coughs> These would be, so for, for that, um, my K uh, would have these units. Um, molarity over... basically just per seconds, okay? It'd be per second because the molarities would cancel, these would cancel, you'd be left with seconds, okay? Because rate is molarity per second. Um, they didn't write that very clearly. But it would be molarity over molarity times seconds, as such like that. These would cancel, you'd be left with seconds, okay? Um, so that's, that's, those are the units of a K for a first order reaction, if it's a first order reaction. What you guys have been doing, what, the last two that you did, what were their orders overall? One. Two. two, because each one is one, one plus one, it would be second order, okay? So we haven't been doing, those other two were second order reactions, we're talking about just the first order reaction. You have just A to product, probably a decomposition reaction, A to product, and it's a, uh, it's a first order rate, okay? Um. <clears throat> okay. Um. Now, this equation Um, actually, we would write it in a different form, but let me just explain it. So, um, this equation would be used to help us determine basically the concentration at any time point. Since we know our K after the reaction goes uh, so many seconds, time in seconds, after it goes this many seconds, what is the concentration? at that time, okay? So we can determine that using this equation. A naught is the initial concentration, um, or the, the concentration at time zero. That'll be our initial concentration. And then I can determine, because I know my K, <coughs> what it's going to be uh, at any time point. And um, if you plot, uh, a first order reaction, A over T, okay? Then you'll get a curve like this, but we can manipulate that by taking the natural log of A in a first order reaction over T, and it'll give us a straight line if it's first order, okay? So if you see uh, a natural log of A over T in a straight, that tells you this is what type of reaction? First order. You should be able to recognize this as a first order reaction because the natural log of A over T, okay, versus T here. 
will give you a negative k. It's going to give you a negative k, a negative slope. <coughs> okay. Um, for first order. And this is actually a more useful equation. This is the one that we would use. Instead of this, we would use this. Okay. The natural log of the initial concentration of A minus KT, the uh, rate constant times the time, will tell me uh, the concentration of A, okay? the natural log of A at any time point. So uh, you, would, you would be able to solve for A here using that information. Now, there are different ways to find a K. You don't only find a K necessarily by um, experimental data. So if I have the experimental data, I can find a K. Okay, you, you now know how to do that. Um, but also, if I, knew, if I knew the time and I knew uh, what the initial concentration was and what the new concentration was at that time, I could also find K, right? So that's another way I could find K if I needed to. <clears throat> okay, so basically, graphically, you would find K as your slope. You would just find the slope. Take two points on the, the line, uh, rise over run, and you would find your, your rate constant, your rate constant for uh, that reaction. So this is obviously a first order reaction. And the decomposition of N2 to N2O5 into NO2 and O2, it's a first order reaction. I know that because look at my graph here. It's a straight line when I take the natural log of the concentration of N2O5 and plot it over time. So I know this is a first order reaction. <clears throat> okay, so um, your slope equals your K, negative. It's a negative slope will equal your, your K there. Okay, the reaction 2A to B is first order in A with a rate constant of 2.8 times 10 negative 2 seconds per negative 1. Now look at this. If I didn't tell you this was a first order reaction and all you saw was the rate constant, you would be able to know it's first order. Why? The units. What are the units of a first order rate constant per seconds? Okay, that's, that's the units of a first order rate constant. So you, you would be able, if I just told you a, 2A to B um, has a rate constant of 2.8 times 10 negative 2 seconds to negative 1, you would, the information first order would be implied. Okay? How long will it take for A to decrease from 0.8 molar to 0.014 molar? Okay? So we want to use this equation. So how long is it going to take to go from 0.8 molar to 0.014 molar? Okay, this is where you're going to have to use the natural log button in your calculator. Does everybody know where that is? Okay, you need to you need to know how to to, to find that button. Um, and the shift function of the natural log is usually e, right? So you, sometimes you you might need to use e if you're going between natural log and E. Okay, so um, the natural log of um, how long will it take for A to decrease from 0.8 to 0.14? So it starts out at 0.88 and it goes to 0.14, so that means that this is 0 0.14 molar here because that's the new concentration that I'm getting to equals the natural log of 0 0.88 uh, minus um, 2, whoops, 
2.8 times 10 to the negative 2. Uh, this is molar seconds to the negative 1. And I want to find the time. Okay? I want to find out what time is. So, what is the natural log of 0.14 molar? Say it again. Negative 1, 9, 7. Okay. Equals, what is the natural log of 0 0.88? Okay, minus 2.8 times 10 to the negative 2 seconds, negative 1. Okay, um, what are you start really working here? So it's just times x. 0.13 minus 2.8 times 10 to the negative 2, what's that? Our negative 0.13 minus 2.8 times 10 negative 2. What is this term? Okay, x. And now I can easily solve for x, right? The time. So. Um, x equals, geez, negative 1.97 divided by negative 0 0.158. Okay, so what's x here? Point 0.7 seconds. Okay. So 65.7 seconds, that's what we want for our time. That's how long it's going to take. Now, if your k is in seconds, your answer will be in seconds for time. If your k is in minutes, your answer will be in minutes. So you can get a k, you can determine a k in minutes rather than seconds if you wanted to. Okay, And so those will be the... Uh, your unit. And if, you're, if your um, k is in seconds, then you need to use your time in seconds if you're not solving for time, if you're actually using time. Okay? What'd you get? 12.46. Oh, 66 seconds. What's, what's wrong? You can't, you can't do the negative 0.13 minus the 2.8 times the next. That one has the x on the x. Oh, that's right. You're right. Yeah. You have to add the 0.13 for every second. Absolutely. What am I doing? Uh, you got to take this to this side, 1.97 plus 0.13. Sorry about that, guys. Got to add it over here, and then you divide by um, 2.8 times 10 negative 2. Gosh, you guys just let me get away with everything. I swear. <laughs> you see back there. Okay, so let's let's rewrite that so it's more clear. Okay. Um.
Okay. <clears throat> That's right. All right, you guys shouldn't let me get away with that kind of stuff. I don't want to confuse anybody. Um, okay, but yes, you do need to subtract those two sides. Okay, now the half-life, first order reactions, half-lives, okay? This is a good way to find a K if, you're not, if you don't have a K, but you have the half-life. If you have the half-life, you can easily find the K um, because, uh, let's simplify this, okay? The half-life for a first order reaction is equal to the natural log of two over K. which is simply 0.693 over k. So if I, have my ha if I know the half-life, which is essentially the concentration cutting in half over uh, a period of time, then I can easily find my k. All right? So I want to make this point clear because, you know, I, have a, I, you know I, I say it every semester, and then I have kids come in, and they're like, I didn't know how to solve this because I, I didn't have a k. And I say, did you, did you have a half-life? Yeah, I had a half-life, but what does that matter? Okay, well, if you have a half-life, you can find your K for a first-order reaction very simply. And that's what they want you to do in the question. They want you to find the K using the half-life. Okay? <clears throat> what is the half-life of N2O5 if it decomposes the rate constant of 5.7 times 10, negative 4? So... 0 0.693 over 5.7 times 10 to the negative 4. Whoops. Oh, yeah, rate constant. What is the half-life? So here I can find the half-life because I have the K. So if I know the rate constant, it's easy to find the half-life. Um, 0.693 divided by 5.7 times 10 to the negative 4. Okay? Um, Twenty minutes. So that point six nine three is just a, a constant over the constant, or over the rate. Yeah, it doesn't change. Point six because it, it's just the natural log there of uh, of two, basically. Okay, because it's first order. It's only for a first order. Right, right. You, you won't have that situation if it's a second order. It'll be different. You have a different half life equation. But if it's a first order reaction and you're trying to determine the amount of time it's going to take to go from one concentration to another concentration, and you need K, they didn't give you K, this is an easy way to do it. This is how I could find K. Uh, they told me the half-life, okay? <coughs> okay. I think we're belaboring most of this now. Okay, second order reactions. So if it's a second order, uh, then A raised to the second order um, would be my rate, exp uh, rate expression would be rate equals the rate constant times A squared. I could easily find my K here. Rate over A squared Okay, would mean that this equals, what are the units of this? Molarities over seconds times molarity squared. So that equals uh, a molarity here and a molarity here cancel. And I get one over um, molarity seconds. Those would be my units. Or m to the negative one, s to the negative one is how they would write it. You would see it written. Okay, so this is for a second order reaction. And in a second order reaction, um, we get a little bit of a different equation uh, for determining time uh, or cha and changes in the concentration. Okay, so what is the concentration at this time or what, how much time does it take to reach this concentration? Now we're, we're actually doing 1 over A. Instead of the natural log of A, we're doing 1 over A. 
And if you plot a second order uh, uh, rate reaction with 1 over A, you'll get a straight line. Okay? If you plot it with the natural log of A, you won't. That's how you know it's a second order. Straight line, 1 over A. All right? And uh, so that's another way you would be able to know that this is a second order reaction because I plot it 1 over A per time. And that slope would be my K. Now it's a positive K. I have a positive K. So I add that here to this term now. OK. Um, 1 over A equals 1 over A naught plus KT. And um, I can solve for those. Here with my half-life, OK, it's not too difficult either. Um, if I know the half-life, I can once again easily find K. Uh, you could take the reciprocal of this and easily um, uh, find your half-life if you knew these two terms, or find your K if you knew the half-life in a not solve for T, uh, solve for K there. Okay, so if I need a K and they give me the half-life, that's how I find it. Use the half-life equation. This equation will be provided you. Okay, you'll have that equation. You just need to know how to use it to find your K. Mm -hmm. Next. I can't write down there very well. Okay, it's not going to let me write down there. But uh, k equals 1 over t1 half times a naught, and that would give me my k. Okay? <clears throat> Zero order reactants um, just simply means that it doesn't cause any change at all. Um, and so if I was to graph it, it would just be a straight line without any manipulation to A. So this would be an indication that this is a zero order reaction. Okay? Um, once again, T1 half, A naught over 2K. Um, a equals A naught minus KT. Once again, it's a minus KT because it's a negative slope. So these are the equations that you'll have as reference material. You're going to have this, you're going to have this, and you'll be able to use them to determine the, the amount of time or the concentration. Yes? So that formula looks like it's very similar to kind of the combination between the first order and the half. Is that pretty much what the zero order reaction is? Um, between the, the, the half-life, is that what you mean? Yeah. Between the half-life equation of this one or the half-life equation of another one? Um, what, um, said it's just kind of that original formula looks like it's really similar to the half-life. And it also looks like it's really similar to the first order. Yeah. So it's kind of like that formula. Oh, yes. That, yeah. Do you mean like, whereas the other one's is natural log of A and this is, yeah. and or the one over A? You will always use A naught as the initial concentration, whatever the starting concentration is. And this is what concentration you're getting to or trying to determine. And your time would simply be um, at what time you get to that concentration. Okay? And all three of them would be the same way. They're all going to work in the same way. Yeah. Okay. So here it is. It's going to go through those uh, equations. This will be your reference material, essentially, to, to work with these. Okay. So we have all the equations. Um, if you don't have k to solve for this, then they probably gave you a half-life. So find k from the half-life. Okay. And then you can use it in this equation. <coughs> Uh, 
Okay. Alright, so activation energy determines the rate of a reaction. Um, activation energy is the energy required to allow the reaction to begin. So if I have two molecules and they have to react, they have to collide with one another. And when they collide, energy will be transferred between them. If enough energy is transferred between in that collision from one molecule to the other one, that allows it to break its bonds, then that will allow it to uh, react. The reaction can proceed forward. Because that's the first thing that has to happen. Bonds must break. They have to break. And how do I break bonds? I absorb energy. Absorb enough energy and your bonds will break. Okay? So here we can see for an exothermic reaction, the amount of energy required to break my bonds is this much. Once I reach that point, I absorb this much energy, okay? That's how much energy I absorbed. After that, I release energy. This is how much energy I released. So, looking at this graph, did I release or absorb more energy? Release. You released. That's why this is exothermic, right? It's an exothermic reaction because I'm releasing overall. The overall effect is energy released because this amount of energy right in here just cancels between the amount of energy uh, absorbed and the amount of energy released to that point. So this is how much energy it overall is released from this reaction. An endothermic reaction would be exactly the opposite of that. This is how much energy is absorbed. And then once those bonds break from the absorption of that energy, this is how much energy is released. So I release this much. That amount cancels. So overall, this is endothermic because that's the amount of energy that I have absorbed overall in this reaction. Okay, So we describe it as an endothermic reaction. Every reaction has endothermic, exothermic portions to it. But the way you describe it is the net effect. What is the net effect? Okay, And this amount of energy absorbed is called the activation energy. Because it's the energy that activates the reaction once those bonds break. They have to break in order for the molecules to rearrange. And then they will find one another and reform bonds. And when they reform bonds, they release energy. <clears throat> okay. Mm. So the Arrhenius equation it allows us to determine um, activation energy from um, rate data, essentially. You'll do this in the lab too. You'll, you'll find the rate at one temperature. You'll find the rate constant at another temperature. Uh, and using that information, you can find out the activation energy of this reaction. Okay. <clears throat> and the R that we're going to use is not the 0 0.0821 gas constant. It's the 8.304 joules per Kelvin mole because we're trying to find energy. So we're going to use the rate constant of 8.304 here instead of um, 0 0.0821. Okay. Um, okay. So and this is how you'll do it. You'll do it at two temperatures. Okay. So essentially, this is the equation you're going to do to determine the activation energy of a reaction um, at two different temperatures. Okay using two different rate constants. So you'll determine the rate constant for a first reaction and um, the temperature that you ran it at. So one is going to be at room temperature. So, but you're not going to use room 25 degrees Celsius. You're going to say 298 Kelvin. Okay. 
So this needs to be in Kelvin temperatures. Uh, K2 uh, at a higher temperature, most likely. Okay, and then you can find the activation energy, the activation energy of that from this equation. Okay. So, what are some of the factors that affect the speed of your reaction, the rate of your reaction? Okay. One of the first factors is orientation, molecular orientation. Okay. So, if I orient my molecules correctly, then they will react with, uh, with the uh, right amount of energy in a collision. But if they are not oriented correctly, when they collide, they just bounce off of each other. So, here we have carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide. Okay. If the oxygen um, hits in the correct place from the carbon monoxide, the reaction will proceed forward. Um, but if it doesn't, it, let's say the oxygen hit the nitrogen instead, um, then they might just bounce off because they're not oriented in the correct way. Okay. Um, to lead to a, uh, a reaction that's actually going to, to result in an effective collision, okay? So that's what we're trying, that's what we're seeing here. We have an effective collision where uh, the, the carbon collides with one of the oxygens, and that's going to result in carbon uh, dioxide formation. <coughs> but if the, the carbon collides with the nitrogen, then it's it bounces off and nothing happens. No reaction will take place. So, if you can orient your molecules correctly, you in, increase the rate of your reaction. Okay, um, but otherwise, a number of these are going to result in ineffective collisions and won't result in a reaction. Okay, so this this is left more to statistics. Statistically, how many? more of these effective collisions versus ineffective ones we have per time that will result in reactions, okay? And uh, that will all be taken into account when you are measuring the time of the reaction, how fast it's going. <clears throat> okay, so um, you can have different steps in a reaction. So like this one, um, nitrogen monoxide will react with nitrogen monoxide to form N2O2. N2O2 then reacts with O2 to form 2NO2. Okay, So you can have different steps. And these would each have their own um, kind of energy curve. So uh, you would almost see these kind of, um, let's see. You would uh, kind of see them with kind of a double uh, hump kind of thing, where this first one is for the first reaction, and then the next one's for the next one. You have those two different activation energies to proceed those two steps forward. Okay, um, that's kind of how an energy diagram for those would look <clears throat> with the two different elementary, uh, two different steps that are taking place. Okay, uh, for your overall reaction. And so each one is going to affect the rate. One of them might be the slower step. And then the, the rate, the actual rate of that reaction will be determined by the slow step. Whichever one is the slowest step is going to determine how fast that reaction is actually going to take place. Okay, so that's just going through that. Okay. So these would be what we consider to be our intermediate uh, reactants in the overall reaction here. <clears throat> so they don't show up in the actual chemical reaction um, that you would, uh, you would write. But they're intermediates. OK. OK, so if it's unimolecular, has one uh, step with one molecule, bimolecular, 
has two molecules, trimolecular, you have three molecules. And those are intermediates. Okay. We're actually not going to do a lot with these, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on them. Um, I think the main thing that you'd want to understand is the rate determining step is the slowest step in the sequence of the steps leading to the product, right? So th that's the thing that's going to determine uh, how fast your reaction is going. So here, let's you have these different uh, uh, rates for the different steps. Whichever one is the slowest, okay? That thing goes slow, and then after it, everything goes fast. And so that determines the rate, essentially, okay, because it's so slow. Um, or if it's, the, if it's a fast step first and then a slow step, then everything catches up to that one slow step, and it's the slow step that is determining the rate of the reaction. Uh, just like when I'm trying to get home, driving down to uh, I-10 here, or not I-10, but 1604, and I'm cruising along till I hit I-10. And I sit there. That's my. That's the step that determines how fast I get home, right? It's it's going to to slow me down. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So you can see the the kind of intermediate step that forms and you have a second activation energy uh, that leads to it. Okay, catalyst. So a catalyst is a, a substance that's going to increase the rate of your reaction. Your reaction will go faster if you have a catalyst present. Okay, oh, guys, when you take a break, don't. Go ahead, 10 minutes. Yes, the PowerPoints are under files. No, they're under pages. Um,